this episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And on today's episode, we have Marius Bernard. Marius Bernard is a former ATP pro who spent 13 years on the tour, winning six titles and reaching the men's doubles quarterfinals at both Wimbledon and the Australian Open. During his playing career, he also had doubles wins over six world number ones, including Roger Federer. While playing on the tour, Marius studied psychology and business management. After his career was over, he used his expertise in performance psychology and business to become a coach and mentor. Today, Marius is an executive coach helping CEOs, directors, and managers improve their performance with tailored development programs and managing their work pressures with self-belief, optimism, and resilience. One of the cornerstones of his coaching work is the clear links model of self-belief, which he uses to help his clients and enhance their personal performance. The model builds self-belief to generate a sustained virtuous cycle of confident future performance. The reason why we asked Marius to be on the Tennis IQ podcast to talk, was to talk about the ClearLinks model and the importance of self-belief for tennis performance, as well as in our daily lives. Self-belief is a topic that we have touched on in the past, and this conversation will definitely deepen your understanding of self-belief as a key ingredient in high performance. Please enjoy this conversation with Marius Bernard. So, Marius, welcome to the Tennis IQ podcast. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here because I think, you know, we're going to talk about a topic that Josh and I have discussed in the past as being quite important to the mental toughness of of tennis players, which is self-belief. But before we get into that, we'd love to have you tell our audience about your career in tennis, how you've gotten to where you are today, um, you know, what you're doing today. And um, yeah, let's just begin with that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I grew up in near Cape Town in South Africa and um, I had uh, quite a few siblings and we were all into sport. And I played a lot of rugby uh, as a kid. That was kind of my dream to play for, for my country when I was young. And um, I just played rugby until about the age of 16 and I really started focusing on tennis. I happened to have some good results at that, that point in time. But before that, I was uh, I had some mental issues. Where I, I struggled to convert match points, which we can talk about later. But uh, that's when I started reading the inner game of tennis because um, I thought I really needed to do something about it. And then I started working on my mentality, being more non-judgmental and focusing on one point at a time, et cetera. And um, that kind of changed my, my career because shortly after that, I won the National Grass Court Championships. And that gave me um, an entry into Junior Wimbledon and, uh, and an air ticket to Junior Wimbledon. So <clears throat> that's when things started changing for me. And after that, I thought, well, maybe I can do this. So at, at Junior Wimbledon, uh, you know, I bumped into people like Jim Courier and, uh, you know, it was that era. So that was a, a tough learning school because these guys had a lot of confidence. Um, and uh, from there on, I sort of, you know, I, in those days, you pretty much did your own thing. You know, there wasn't these big entourages, you know, stringers and psychologists and everything. Um, we were in a squad of players from South Africa, but uh, slowly but surely, I uh, sort of carved my way out as a, as a top doubles player. Um, I had some good singles wins, but most of my my wins came from doubles. So I won six career titles. Um, I was eight times finalist. I guess the, the interesting thing is I, I beat six world number ones singles players in doubles, including uh, Roger Federer and um, Roddick and, um, you know, players like that of that caliber. So uh, that, that was kind of highlights looking back. And... Uh, um, you know, I made the quarterfinals of the Australian Open, quarterfinals of Wimbledon. And uh, when I finished my career, I played for 13 years on the tour. When I finished my career, I, I started coaching and also did some teacher training, et cetera, and been doing that for about 18 years now, you know, coaching a lot of players. Uh, but I've recently, in the last three years, uh, started doing executive coaching, coaching business people, and uh, just finding a lot of similarities between the mindset that you need in business uh, to succeed uh, compared to what you need on the sporting arena. 
So uh, that's where I am right now. Yeah. Well, it's a great, you know, great story and a, a great sort of career arc to getting to where you are today. And you mentioned, you know, you've got perhaps some some anecdotes from your own career with respect to confidence and, and self belief. And I think it'd be great to hear some of that. So, you know, how do you, and maybe through your own stories, can get into this? But how critical do you think self belief and confidence are for tennis players, especially towards their mental toughness? Yeah, I think I think it's really important, and I think um, that's when, when after my career, I look back, I um, kind of formulated a, a clear links model, uh, which is you know a model of sort of four things that I think is really critical, uh, and I'll just briefly explain them to you. The uh, perception that you have of what is happening to you is obviously critical. You know. The, the way we experience things isn't the same for everybody. So um, what is your reality? And you can shape that. And the important thing there is your memories. You know, which of the memories are you, uh, you know, focusing on? Because uh, your memories aren't a recording of your life. You can pick the ones you, you favor. And I've learned to do that. And I've also seen people who have performed at a really high level, how they do pick out the best memories rather than those bad moments. Uh, they don't tell you that they served a double fault on break point, but they might tell you about the winning passing shot down the line. That's the one they, they tend to remember. And so then that becomes your narrative and uh, the story that you tell yourself, uh, you know, which is really important. Uh, and the story that you think other people believe about you, the, these are two really critical em, uh, elements. And then that shapes your belief and then eventually your self-belief. Now, uh, the interesting thing, you talked about confidence uh, and self-belief. Um, I think when we talk about confidence in tennis, that can go up and down. But self-belief tends to be there you know, all throughout, you know, okay, it can go over years, it can go up and down, but people have a sort of a base level of self-belief. And um, I always try to improve mine, especially when I later on in my career, and this is where experience comes in. But there's another concept, um, self-efficacy, um, that I think is really important. And that's the belief that you have, that you can complete a task or a job, you know. And uh, I think if you look back at the Australian Open, you know, Novak Djokovic, nine times in the final, nine wins. I mean, that's going to do a hell of a lot for your self-efficacy. You know, you know you can go out there and, and win it. You know, people saying that the gap is so big between the other players in the top three. And, and I think it's experience is, is a major factor in that. Uh, and people sometimes overlook the fact that a grand slam is a very different animal from a, a normal tournament. And you know, especially in that last weekend where some players have two days off and another player's got a day off, how to prepare. Uh, personally, I, I used to love playing day after day. I didn't like the, the long breaks that you would face in a, in a slam. You know, you'd sometimes play on the Monday, first round opening, and then your opponents are playing on the Wednesday, so you play next match on Thursday. It, it just upsets that natural rhythm that you get into. And, and Grand Slams are very different from your normal tournament where you play, you know, five days in a row. And, uh, and, and people shouldn't underestimate that. And these guys have done it for so many years now that they, they, are, they just know exactly how to, you know, when to practice, when to take a day off, you know, when you're going for a massage, when you, when you need to hit some more balls, you know, they, they get into a rhythm of that. So, yeah, I think Novak Djokovic is, is, is a, one of the best examples now of somebody with a lot of self-belief. Um, and they, at the moment, him and Nadal, they don't seem to be dropping off very much. Uh, and Nadal's had a few injury issues. And I, I think when it comes to clay, he'll probably be right up there again. But... Um, it, the time will come when these guys will lose, but uh, they're not yet ready to to hand over to the next generation. And and I don't think the next generation is 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 playing badly or they've got a 
confidence problem or anything like that. I think it's just a matter of time. And I think uh, Medvedev looked a bit tired. And then after that first set where he, he really gave it everything and, and, you know, then it just seems like he thought Djokovic is going to be too good on the day. And, uh, you know, then you start trying too hard and making uh, errors, unforced errors. So um, I think their time will come, but um, not yet. Yeah, well, uh, no, you, you referenced your uh, the, the clear links model that you that you developed. Um, I'd yes. like to dive, dive a little deeper into that. Um, yes. Particularly, you know, as it relates to self-belief and uh, I guess any specific interventions that... Um, that you've used or that you have found helpful in terms of, you know, in terms of maintaining self-belief and in terms of reinforcing the different links um, of yes. that. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's a great question. How do you do it? Uh, one of my things that I started from an early age was uh, visualizing. And so um, visualizing before an event, uh, but also visualizing after an event. And, and again, you, you pick the things you want to visualize. Um, so, for instance, before a match, I, I, I try and visualize myself playing great tennis, but I also visualize myself when there's a major obstacle. Um, so I've played against players who have really tried everything in the book, and you, and you know the kind of player you're going to play. So you, you, you visualize certain things that could happen. I mean, I can give you an example. Um, a guy jumping into your service box, making noise with his feet just before you serve on, 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 on break point. That's happened to me. Uh, players playing mind games, turning up at the courts with their bags packed, you know, <laughs> in Tokyo, you know, and you think my partner saying to me, I think, you know, they, they're not that into this match. They want to get on the flight tonight. And I said, you know, just don't pay any attention to that. And sure enough, you know, they turned it around in the third set and started playing really well. Um, so when you, you, you try and predict, and this is where experience comes in. And I mean, you've seen Djokovic sometimes, you know, acting on the court, like he's injured and, and it's just managing the ebb and flow of a match and the intensity and, and the rhythm. And, um, so with experience, you learn what the things are that you can expect from different players. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, really visualizing um you know beforehand is really important the other the other really important bit of this and and, and you'll understand what i'm talking about is, is the the timing of the emotions when you're in the middle of it so when you're under pressure in a match and this really unexpected occurrence happens and you, you your emotional brain is going to take over and you know if you're not prepared for it, that is the first thing that goes into your mind. You, you need that space before you react. If you visualize before the match, how are you going to react in a certain situation and you're prepared, then your brain kicks into that sort of what they call the computer, which, you know, you've rehearsed it, you're ready for it. So you've maybe got to think, like, I know this guy, um, you know, he's going to misbehave when he's down a break and you prepare for it, when it happens, you're not going to get upset or you're not going to get distracted. And that's important because in the heat of the moment, if you let your emotions take over and it always goes to the emotional brain first, if you let that run, then sometimes you're going to, um, you know, behave in the wrong way and you're going to react in the wrong way. It's, it's so, interesting you use the, the computer model there because actually I, I often will talk about that in a computer science model called if this, then that. And yeah. it's, you know, it's really basically having a plan for every sort of contingency that could happen. Yeah. So if you have somebody jumping around into the service box while you're serving at 3040, um, if you've already planned, if this happens, then I do that. You are not going to be distracted, right? You'll be able to maintain your mental toughness throughout that, yes. that scenario. Yeah. And because your emotions will always give you a message first. It's like, what the hell is he doing? Doesn't he know the, the etiquette of tennis? Um, but, you know, you, you, if, if you're pre prepared for that and you, and you know how you're going to react, then it's a, a lot easier because the emotions are also very quick. You know, they, 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 they jump in straight away. 
So, yeah, that's what I used to do before matches. After matches, um, you know, you you want to learn from your mistakes. So also when you play, you know, is there something technically I've done wrong in that point? You make a quick decision. Yes, I can maybe do this differently or no, that was just, and then you move on. And so, so then after the match, when you visualize, you, you try and pick out the, the best moments, you know, there's no, no point in going over and over and over, you know, um, you know, double faulting on, on break point or, or match point. Or, in fact, that <laughs> this was a, an interesting story. It leads me back to this time when I was started reading the inner game of tennis. It was actually a, a big catalyst for that because I played in uh, interprovincial, which is like a, you know, sort of interstate competition, I guess, in America. Um, and I played one of my arch rivals uh, and I had a few match points in the tiebreaker, had a few more match points. And, I walked off the court and I had 17 match points and lost the match. In fact, I, I called him. It's a guy called David Adams. I called him a few years ago because I was doing a few talks in the area and I, and, I, and I needed to get my facts right. And I said, are you sure it was 17 match points? Yeah, it was 17 match points. Where, and then after that match, I decided that, you know, I need to change. There's something in my mindset that need to change. So, um, I um, started reading the inner game of tennis, Timothy Galway. Tiny little book um, and just great information on being non judgmental, playing one point at a time. And I think that was the real key for me is changing my mindset to one point at a time. I think if there's one thing that I thought made a, a massive difference to my career is that. Because what I did is I, I um, really started saying, what I'm going to do is play every single point. And what I'm thinking about is the strategy that I'm going to try and execute on the very next point. So I, I became really focused on my strategy and my process and try to get the significance of the point score out of my mind. And so I, I did that. And that's when I won that grass court tournament, but these things take practice and I, you know, practiced it and practiced and got better and better at it. And I, and I said to a guy the other day, I think if you can do that, if you can really apply that uh, philosophy of just what I want to do the very next point, and that's all you're focusing on, it, 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 it gets rid of almost 70% of all problems in tennis because, you know, mentally that, that is, you know, looking back, looking forward, those are the, are the big problems that, that, that people, you know, when they mentally, when they start breaking down is due to that. Anyway, so I worked on that for, for, for years. And then uh, I played in the finals of the Kremlin Cup in Moscow. That was about six years after that occurrence. And I played again, <laughs> played David Adams, the guy, same guy. I had 17 match points as a junior, played him in the finals. And I remember ripping this return we're in the tiebreaker in the third set in the finals and i ripped this ball return down at the feet next ball ball dipping down they missed the volley and i turned to my partner and i said come on next point like this and he runs over to me jumps into my arms and he says we've won we've won and 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 i didn't realize it was match point because I, I was so zoned in on what i had to do um and so, yeah, that, that really served me well because it, 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 I, I clearly had a problem with the nerves of getting close to match point. And, and, and it sort of just – and it didn't happen every match, but I can re it happened about three times in my career when I didn't realize it was match point. Um, but also, it, it, in general, it just made me a lot calmer because all I tried to do was execute that process of what my strategy is. And, and, and the – the other thing that I did was it's, it's a strategy I'm trying to execute, but I'm not saying you must do it. It's like, this is what I'm going to try and do because there's a slight difference in the pressure. And, and that's what I tell my players a lot. You know, if it doesn't work, don't worry. You know, it's just, this is your focus. This is what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, the visualizing is, is an interesting thing, uh, Josh. 
you were asking about what I did. I, I've worked with players and they've actually struggled to visualize their good moments from the past. And then we sort of had to tell them that when you play that match, when you walk off, try and remember how you served out. Try and remember, you know, those good returns you've played on match point because that is uh, sort of fuel for your future confidence. You, know, you need to keep refueling that. And uh, some players do uh, have a, a, you know, a better ability to visualize than others and they, they have to work at it. So no, I, I used to be quite good at visualizing. As a youngster, I used to visualize myself playing rugby for my country and, you know, all sorts of things. So um, you, you practice it from a, from a young age, I guess you get better at it. But um, some people have to work a little bit harder at, at visualizing. Obviously, they have different ways of learning as well. Maybe it's, it's sound. Maybe it's more the vision. You know, I was quite, I was, I was into art as a kid as well. So um, I think that's why visualizing has been quite easy for me quite natural as well. I think the post-match visualization is really great because, um, and, and you're right, people have a hard time doing it. I was talking to a player yesterday and asking him to remember that type of thing. And the exercise I put him through was, you know, so ESPN is obviously, it's a global name, but it's very big here in the United States. Yeah. Uh, pretend you work for ESPN and you're putting together the highlights of the match. Yeah. Which, which points would you put in there? Um, and it gets them to at least begin to think about, oh, yeah, all right, I can kind of look back and, and, and do that. And I usually tell the story because that actually was an internship job I had. I used to work for a, a sports network and I would watch games and take notes. And then I would take the tape and actually make those highlights. And yes. it's a really good way to think of your matches. Yeah, very good. In fact, that just reminded me um, when I was a kid, my my brother and my sister were they they were sitting outside the bathroom listening to me because I used to um, you know commentate on my favorite match, and uh, they used to take the Mickey out of me for doing that. I didn't know they were listening in, so I was going for about three or five minutes. You know, uh, all my players are performing and so on. So yeah, it's um, it, it's it's great to cultivate that, but. Um, uh, it's quite interesting if you, if I think that going back to that book, w which was um, my mum kind of threw it in my bag when I went on the road, and um, I don't know if she thought I would read it or not, and it actually made a big impact. Yeah, we've uh, inner game of tennis is definitely something we've we've referenced a number of times in in previous episodes. Um, we actually had Sean Brawley on mm -hmm. in a previous episode who uh, you know worked worked with Tim Galloway for many years, and uh, we've talked a lot about. Um, the importance of having that that present moment focus rather than constantly thinking, um, looking back towards you know previous points or previous matches or thinking about the future. The what if what if I lose this this game here? What if I lose this match? What if I win? But trying to you know constantly come back to the present moment and focusing on that next point. And I like that you said that that you know by doing that one thing that fixed what seventy percent of of the problems right there just by let's let's stay present here let's focus on that next point um i guess um as it relates to tennis players and i guess other other sorts of athletes how can we you know as coaches as uh you know sports psychology professionals as executive coaches too how can we help individuals to better achieve that sort of focus um and that sort of present present minded mentality um time and time again yes um that's a great question. I'm, I'm on a course at the moment, um, a business uh, executive course, and it's all about um, the command muscle of your brain. So um, we are doing things like um, obviously connected to breathing. And when you were saying visualizing, I used to um, sort of sit in a very comfortable position or even lie down and breathe deeply before I visualize sort of to get myself into the right frame of mind. Um, and this is sort of the more senses you can use, the better. So we were, we were um, doing a lot of breathing at first. And then another way, I don't know if you're familiar with anchoring uh, some of your memories. So we were doing things like just rubbing our fingers to get you really in the right frame of mind. And then when you visualize with that, now repetition is obviously key. So the, the idea is eventually 
when you're taking real note of the feeling here of your fingers, you, you, you're visualizing it, you know, you can almost hear the sounds. Then you, you're anchoring all these good memories with your touch, your vision, your hearing, you know, if you, even if you can bring in a smell or anything, even better. And, and that way, the memories are a lot more vivid. And, you, and, and, and if you visualize like that, your, your visualizations will be a lot more vivid as well. Um, so we're actually using that command muscle. It's called the PQ. It's uh, Shirzat Shamin. He's a professor at um, um, sorry, it's California. Uh, I'll c- come back to you. I don't want to get it wrong. Stanford, I think it was. Um, and the idea is about taking command of your brain and making sure that your focus is on positive um, on positive thoughts. So if you have a, a negative thought that comes into your mind, uh, you'll go like this and you'll go, no, I'm going to see the opportunity in that situation. I'm going to see the gift of that situation rather than the negative side of things. And um, so the, these are things you can use to, um, to improve your, the command of your brain. And so you think about the right things uh, and also you need to have that self-awareness because sometimes people walk around and they have thoughts going in, around in their mind, negative or positive, and, and, and they don't know. Um, Johnny Murray, who uh, won Wimbledon doubles, uh, I think it's 2012, he, uh, he worked with a psychologist in that year and he said he actually played less tennis in that year, but he every morning after breakfast, he visualized for 10 minutes and he was – thinking about what he was saying to himself. And then if there was a, a negative thought, then he would change it into a positive. So one of the things he used to say is when he got to a, a big tournament, like, you know, the sort of uh, Indian Wells and the slams, he would think that maybe I don't belong in the last, in the last eight or the last, you know, in the semifinals. When I get to semifinals, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit out of my league. And he changed that in that year and uh, and he had the best run uh, at Wimbledon and the other thing he also said was that he was just in the finals he was just having fun he was just him and his partner were just having fun unfortunately his partner then decided to pursue his career in singles and and so they didn't play again but it was interesting that he didn't play more that year he actually played less but he had this real regime of every day doing his visualization after breakfast and at night. And, and, and that really turned his, his mindset around. I mean, I think as sports psych professionals, one of the things that Josh and I work on all the time is de- helping athletes develop awareness. And um, I think we even had this conversation with Sean Brawley, uh, Josh, you know, about mindfulness and meditation as being another means of, of doing, you know, exactly what you're talking about in terms of, you know, locking something in and and when you were describing that it almost made me think or it did make me think of you know how we appraise things um because it, yes i understand i am having this thought now i'm going to reappraise my situation maybe as an opportunity rather than a threat um yes. and i think yet yeah, as we help athletes as you said develop awareness then that then these possibilities open up yeah no, definitely. I, I saw a documentary, um, I think he's Professor David Eagleman from uh, California, and he was saying, um, what is your reality? And he sort of looked at that concept. And um, you know, it takes me back to that time when I arrived at Junior Wimbledon and um, you know, I was rubbing shoulders with Jim Courier and uh, some other top American players and, and just listening to them in the locker room. And, and even my, um, the player I um, mentioned to you earlier that we, we won some tournaments with Pete Norville, the South African guy who played with Wayne Ferreira in the Olympics. Uh, they had an amazing amount of confidence in their ability. And um, just listening to them after a match, you can tell they which areas of the match they've picked out as um, these are the things that we're going to remember. And, uh, you know, it, it's so important. You know, if you think about day after day, 
what's that message you keep reinforcing? Um, you know, after five years, how that can grow, you know, or how that can shrink, <laughs> you know, if it's the wrong message. So um, then I realized to myself, you better start making these thoughts going around in your mind, make them beneficial, you know, and start believing in, in what you have. Otherwise, um, no, nobody else will believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. So you mentioned uh, confidence. Um, I guess, I guess a question that I have is how do you, where do you draw the line between confidence and self-belief? Obviously they're, they're very linked, uh, but do you, do you see a difference between the two and how would you differentiate the two of those, um, of those terms, of those concepts? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a tough one uh, to, to exactly draw a line. Um, as I say, I think confidence can can go up and down. Like for instance, as tennis players, we speak about it and we we'll say, "Oh, this week I feel confident, you know, because um, I'm hitting the ball well and I won my first round." Um, but I think that the more important thing is that the players who, you know, perform year after year, like for instance, your Federer, people like that at that level, that the, they have self belief that is there all the time, you know, they'll take six months off because of injury and they'll come back, they'll train and they'll get to the same level again. So they, they obviously have that belief and that confidence that this is where I belong. And they normally can get their, their playing level up to that, that level. Um, it, it's very interesting if you look at players when they get injured and they can't play for a year or two. And you know, you've got the protected ranking and they, they come back. But how often, <laughs> and this sort of intrigues me, they can get, they work their way up. It takes them a long time. They get up to that level they, that they were before. And then, then they settle there again. You know, you, you'd have thought because of the injury, because of the lack of play, they'll struggle to get up to that level. Or if they do get up there quickly, why don't they go beyond that level? Um, and I think mostly when people make a jump, a leap in there, is normally when there was a sort of a, a mental shift that, you know, that, that's often when people, so if you were a top 50 player and then after a number of years, suddenly the player goes into the top 20, I would say players often attribute that to a mental shift that they've had. Now, I can think of one example. When I was playing, I fractured my hand and um, I, I was out for six weeks. And I remember the first day I started playing, I was really holding the racket loosely, just hitting softly against the wall. It was aching. First tournament obviously didn't go very well. And then because mentally over that six-week period, I, I really started focusing and thinking, probably doing more visualization because that, that's all I could do. Two weeks later, I won a tournament. It was a sort of a smaller tournament. And then three weeks after that, two weeks after that, I actually teamed up with David Adams, the guy who I lost all the match points against, and, and we won the tournament. And I'm thinking, this is the biggest win of my career. You know, this is literally eight, 10 weeks after I fractured my hand. What, why did I? But it's that sort of mental shift that I made is like, well, I can't play and I really want to play. And when I came back, I was playing with more, it's almost like the shackles were off. It's like, right, you've got a chance now, just go for it. And, and suddenly I, I had better results, you know, um, less practice, but slightly different mindset. Yeah. Which I think, yeah, you know, if we bring that back to your clear links model, Right, you know, you because the clear you could look at the clear links model as being rather neutral on self belief. It's all what is the content of your perceptions, memories, narratives, beliefs, right? Because they could yes. easily lead to a decrease depending on yeah. how how one thinks. But you just yeah. had a, a nice story there of how you know having um, you know how, having a shift there in some perceptions and beliefs of what was going on really drove drove a performance, and I think that's really key as we begin to work with players on, on building each of these four boxes 
you know, in, in productive ways to, to build that self-belief, which is probably, like you said, more of a stable trait over time than the ebbs and flows of confidence, which is often related to the moment or, I mean, because even I could say, oh, hey, I'm confident I'm playing great this week. But then it's break point at four or five and I get a little shaky and I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure about my kick serve right now. Um, yeah. You know, so it can even go in, you know, it maybe goes with trust when we're on the court or a little bit where self-belief is more of that, yes. that piece of what you're talking about. And I think it's highly related to self-efficacy um, you know, that I can do it. I have done it. Um, yeah. and, I, and I've got that, that sort of experience in the bank. Um, but I'm curious, uh, Marius, if you have found, I think it's in your, your model, but um, optimism and how that relates to self-belief in, in your yes. clear links model. No, definitely, Brian. I mean, I think that I, I, I sort of developed that model and I don't know if you saw at the bottom there, it was like, uh, these are beneficial beliefs to help my improvement. That's that's the whole goal is to, so with my perceptions, with my memories, with my narrative, these are all there to feel this beneficial belief system that I'm trying to get into place. You know, so uh, it's like a virtuous cycle right. that I'm, I'm trying to improve all of this because I realize the other guys, if I listen to them, they've got supreme confidence and they've got self-belief. And, and you know, if I want to compete with them, I'm going to have to, because I, I wouldn't say, uh, I, I think I, as, a, as a young player, I had an inner belief up to a certain level. But I wasn't majorly confident in the sense that, you know, some people just ooze confidence. I mean, sometimes you've got to ask, is it, is it uh, real confidence or is it just uh, a front? You know, you've seen those as well. But, um, yeah, it was, it was more of a quiet self-belief in my abilities. I mean, certainly in my abilities as a rugby player, as a tennis player, you know, because I, I used to do this as a kid all the time. So, um there are different ways of, um, you know, sort of showing how much belief you have. And uh, I mean, that's, that's also very important. I mean, especially in, in my executive coaching, but even on the tennis court, you can sometimes see through a player's, um, you know, charade of, um, you know, the, the, the body language that they have or the facial expressions. And uh, if you play for, for years and years, you, you sometimes can, can tell, you know, um, what might be underneath and that it's just a facade, you know, they might not really be as confident as, as they look from, from the outside. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it was a definite decision by me at some point that this whole cycle should be a virtuous cycle and that I'm keep building it and keep improving it because it was really made, it was sort of, created for my benefit rather than, um, uh, but as you say, if, if, if it goes down the wrong track and it becomes negative, then, then obviously um, that can have a, a really bad effect if you, if you lose self-belief. And that's why the stories you tell yourself about yourself and how, how you experience things, they are so important. Yeah, and so could you talk a little bit about optimism? And how that might fit into your your model? Yeah, that that yeah. is often noted as an important piece of self belief. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've actually done uh, recently a thing called Strength Scope, um, and 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 optimism came out quite high. So yeah, that's like the expectation that things are going to turn out well, and. Again, for resilience is something that uh, we talk in the business world a lot about at the moment, um, especially after last year. And optimism, you know, really helps resilience. You know, it. Um, if you if you're looking at resilience, there's the one thing of the reality, accepting the reality. Then you have to find meaning in your life, and then you have to find. Uh, an innovative way of, you know, change and taking action. So, and I think um, that's really connected to that part, uh, the, the optimism, to meaning, you know. Uh, 
what's the meaning? Why am I doing this? Am I optimistic that tomorrow is going to be a better day? Or do I think that this is it and, you know, uh, tomorrow is going to be terrible? So, yeah, I, I think optimism is really important. That, that feeling, there's always a, a, a feeling that, yeah, it's going to be better or I can fix it. I can do something about this or there will be an opportunity. Uh, talking about that, um, there were three big um, moments in my career that sort of was pivotal in me starting from juniors. And they occurred within a week or two of a really bad result. Moments when I, when I was 18, I was in the army, I, was played, a, I played a tournament and I, I wanted to quit. I, I, I lost this match. You know, it was under floodlights and I played really terribly. And then two weeks later, I won the national championships, the national close championships, which was at that time was a massive result for me. Um, I can think of about uh, at least three where I had really, for me, major results, and it just followed on a real low point about two weeks before. And again, it, it might have something to do with the fact of, you know, now I'm just going to go for it. I don't care. I'm losing my inhibitions here. I'm just going to put it all on the court. Um, but uh, the other thing about it is I think as a, as a player, you, you never know when that moment is going to come, when everything just clicks into place. And you need to be ready for it. So the, the main thing is after those low points, I didn't give up. I, I, I just, I put more into practice. I focus more and I, and I came back. So um, yeah, there's always that expectation that, that things are going to get better. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned your work um, as, a, as an executive coach currently. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the parallels um, between life as a professional tennis player and uh, what you're doing today as an executive coach? Yeah, it's, it's it, it, every day I, I just realize more and more how important it is, you know, and how tennis has shaped me, um, you know, in my mindset and, and you know, with optimism, re resilience, all those things. Uh, I read a, a piece uh, a few weeks ago uh, where they looked at resilience and it says that if you are put through tough times as a kid and you come through it, it has almost got an inoculating effect on your resilience. And, and I think that's what um, young sports stars, doesn't matter what sport you play, in, you're in a sporting arena and you're being put under pressure, you know, and you lose. I mean, as tennis players, we know we lose. Every player loses except the winner that week. So you're always going to lose. Uh, and obviously, if it means a lot to you, then you go through a little bit of trauma, you know, dealing with these losses, you know, chances you had that, 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 that went by the by for whatever reason. You got nervous or you, you, you had that example, your, your second serve left you. I had a moment like that too uh, in one match. Um, and, but you build up this resilience. Yeah, I've come through this. I can do it again. I'm going to try again. And, um, you know, and, and it's for every sport, you know, you will get that, you know, whether it's football, NFL, or soccer, or, you know, whatever it is, um, basketball, the, these things really shape your, you as a person and your mindset. And so um, taking it on to the, um, as I said, resilience is a thing that, that we talk about a lot uh, in executive coaching. Um, goal setting, you know, as an interesting thing about goal setting is when I started out as 18, at 18 years old, I sort of said to myself, right, because I wanted to go and study architecture. And I said, well, I'm going to give this a tennis a go. And I, if I don't hit the top 50 in two years, then I'm going to go back and study architecture. And that was my... Um, my goal. And it took me six years <laughs> to reach that goal. Uh, so the, the thing is, when you set your goals, you don't know the, you know, what's the market like, you know, what are the opposition like? 
how lucky am I going to be? You know, if I look back at my career, I probably had one trip that I never should have gone on to, to play on clay because it didn't suit my style, but the, our tennis union sent us there uh, in a squad of six players. You know, so you can look back and you go, I regret that. But um, you set your goals and, um, you know, I was fully committed to doing that, but it took me so much longer. I guess you could say I didn't give up, but, um, you know, you, you don't know. And then that's the beauty of sport, isn't it? Because you give it your all, you give 100%, uh, but there's no guarantees that you're going you're gonna to do it. And I think that's what really prepares you for life. You know, if you're in situations in a business where, you know, you're going to do X, Y, and Z, uh, and you know that, you know, maybe – there are other forces out there and we might not hit our goals. Then you just reset your goals and you try again. <laughs> that, that's what life's about, isn't it? Just resetting and trying again. And you've probably had, you know, more challenges than ever with, you know, businesses during a global pandemic. Um, certainly not anything most of us would have predicted uh, perhaps. Right. And uh, so, how, how are you seeing people handle that and, you know, being able to adapt and, and shift, you know, Josh and I have talked about that, I think on some episodes, because really the pandemic is what, why we got introduced to each other. We would never have met All if right. it were not for this. And so, you know, yeah. So, so this is, um, yeah. I mean, even this conversation, um, I think that that's another, you know, one of those opportunity or a gift, you know, we, we, we're all sitting at home. Now, what do we do? Okay, so we, we have a podcast. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, it really, you just got to look for those opportunities and, and, and be ready, you know, um, be, as I said, creative and try and find a way of, of doing something and doing it better. And so it, it is amazing, actually, how well, I think companies have done in this period because, you know, my first thoughts were well, a lot of businesses are not able to operate. You know, the economy is going to, you know, just wipe 40% off the economy, you know, but actually it, it is not, people have found a way. And I think that's the thing about uh, human beings because they, they have the mental side, you know, they can think outside the box and come up with a, you know, and I'm not saying that it's been an unbelievable effects. It's rippled through to every part of society. And, uh, you know, and I'm not even talking about, you know, all the lives have been lost and everything. But, um, you know, people have found ways of doing things differently. And, and, and they will have to continue doing that. You know, uh, I don't know what the status is in your uh, part of the world, but uh, we've not hit a tennis ball here since the 1st January. So are we looking at um, 29th of March, first time anybody can play tennis. So um, my boys are hitting against the wall. The, 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 the ball's bouncing on grass, which is not ideal, but uh, this time of year. <laughs> but I'll get the roller out. <laughs> well, I feel, I feel fortunate to continue to be able to uh, coach during this time, um, as well as, you know, working with, players virtually on, on the sports psychology, but uh, I, I also look forward to some grass court tennis, but when the weather's a little bit nicer over, over the summer months. Um, but I think you, I think you bring up a great point about, uh, you know, constantly having to adapt and, and having to deal with that adversity. And then ultimately that adversity does, you know, make, make you stronger and turn you into, you know, it, it leads to that growth. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as, as Brian mentioned, uh, without, without the pandemic and without, um, you know, having to make, um, adjustments to our businesses and everything, we never would have met and, and ultimately started this, this podcast, I guess, I guess the question is, um, when you, when you work with athletes, or, sorry, when you work with executives, um, how, how do you help them, you know, get over maybe some of those frustrations that they're going through during these challenging times and try to help them turn, turn those frustrations and those, challenging moments into into growth and, and ultimately into um into them achieving what what they're set out to you know what they're they're aiming for in terms of their businesses yeah no i think that's something we've looked at 
a few times over the last year. And um, the first thing is you, you have to reset because if you think about the goals you, you might have had in January last year and, you know, it's just that script goes right out the window. And um, so I think it's important to have different sets of goals, um, which I guess you, you, you can have in, in normal conditions as well. You know, you've got your goals that you think, oh, if things are going well, we can do this, you know, then you have goals. Well, if 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 things don't go great, we'll have a. And then then you've got the goals during the pandemic. You know, had to be really lowered, um, and uh, you have to reset that because I think if you don't, then then you know you'd go crazy because um, a lot of things that you would try and do just just are out of the question. And so the the sort of scales of effort reward you know those totally changed last year and um and so i think you you need to step back and just see what's the backdrop and then let's reassess what we're doing um and uh, you know so that that would be my my main advice is to you know have a look at that reality and 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 reassess everything and um then you can project, you know, we didn't know how long it was going to last. Here we are, um, you know, we sort of over 12 months now since we had lockdown first in the UK. And um, as I say, we're still not um, open with um, gyms and tennis is going to have to wait another three weeks or so. So, um, and that's just outdoor tennis. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a whole new way of looking at things but as you say people have come up with some great ideas you know it's, it's made certain things like this virtual conversations um i belong to a, a speaking um uh, society and, and we've we've had meetings with people all over the country all over the world which normally you go to a spot in your in yorkshire and you know there'll be 30 people there um but uh, so yeah it has opened up Loads of opportunities, and I, I think for you, it's probably been uh, very good, hasn't it? Because uh, people have no choice but to, you know, do that uh, sports psychology, um, you know, virtually at the moment. Yeah, I think for Josh and I, the the pandemic certainly it it, pro- it affected our businesses greatly. But we didn't have much activity going on, and I think we were both searching for for projects. And Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was really around that time that you began transitioning to the, the Hall of Fame in Newport, maybe a little bit after that, but that you probably started that search. Um, and so it's been good in a way that we've done such things because I think it's actually given us a little bit more, um, in a way, marketing by putting our names out there and being more present with what's what's going on. Um, and, and I think businesses have now begun to uh, really get back on their feet, especially, you know, um, I think we're mo- both busier than ever, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, I think we, we've, we, as being sort of agents of change, we had to kind of apply our own, you know, we had to really start, you know, eating our own dog food per se, I guess, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and really turning that lens inward. But that's been a, a really good, good thing for us. And, um, you know, so I think, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Josh, but it feels like um, in, in, in many ways we've been able to adapt and, and grow grow what we've done. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I can talk personally. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, certainly a challenging time between uh, the the university, Sacred Heart University that I was at, you know, our, our season wrapping up abruptly as all other teams did at the same time. Um, but also, you know, with my business things that it certainly took a big hit. Um, but I think, uh, laying some of the foundation during that time, whether it be, uh, whether it was participating in, uh, conversations like the, like the virtual coffee hour where we connected and connected with Christina, um, or, you know, starting this podcast or starting the USPTA, um, New England sports psychology committee, or sort of laying some of these foundations for projects and for, um, you know, new opportunities has definitely, um, you know, has definitely reaped, reaped the rewards in later months. And I think, yeah, as you said, in a more 
societal level, I think a lot of um, businesses and, and individuals have adapted to, uh, you know, to, to doing things virtually, to, um, um, yeah, to, to being able to, to think on their feet and to almost finding a new normal in terms of not just going back to the status quo in terms of, okay, this is how things have always been done. This is how we do things here, but okay, let's, let's adapt. Let's, you know, be forward thinking. Let's, um, let's be ready for, I don't want to say the next pandemic, but the next um, situation where we have to adapt and change and think on our feet. So I, I, I think, and I'd like to think that, um, you know, one of the positives of this time is that now we're ready for anything. Now, you know, if, when disaster strikes, when, um, when, when challenges arise, that um, society is a little bit more prepared. Um, so that, that's what I'd add there. Yeah, and I think if we're talking, you know, even the ClearLinks model, Marius, so we could look at this as, um, you know, how do we find the silver lining? How do we find the benefit of what we've been through? It's not all terrible, right? And yeah. How can we use some of that then to move forward and adjust and 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 be more adaptable and more resilient? Yeah, definitely. Like, like Josh was saying, you know, hopefully we'll never have to deal with something like this again, but. Um, there will be other things, you know, we had the financial disaster 2008 and, you know, who knows, you know, what will come. And we, we've had uh, different, I think the, the one thing that, that we're sure of is that things are changing very quickly globally. Um, and um, we, we have to adapt, you know, as, as things moved on, move on. I am, um, I was scheduled to do uh, some coaching at a company on the 23rd of March. This is the day Britain locked down. And the company didn't want to go virtually with the coaching. And so I resumed it in October. So it was uh, literally from uh, March until October. And, and now all those clients have gone virtually. So, um, you know, it's just making that, that, that mental shift um, and, and what's acceptable. And, um, and there, you know, a lot of new ways of interacting uh, will become the norm. Yeah, I, I've been having a, a virtual coffee with my brother in South Africa, which I've never had before. You know, it was normally just a quick phone call or something, but, uh, uh, you know, there, there are some good things that have, that have come out of, this um, and and I think yeah we just have to keep being open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. Absolutely, yeah. So, well, Marius, I want to thank you for joining us today on the Tennis IQ podcast. I think this was a great conversation about self belief, resilience, confidence, a lot of great topics, especially for tennis players and 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 how we apply those things in our everyday lives. So, thanks thanks again for joining us today. No, it's been my pleasure. Um, I found the uh, questions very insightful. So uh, it, uh, it was a pleasure for me to, uh, to have an hour with you. Yeah, thank you. This was, this was great. I mean, I think I, I know our, our listeners and viewers will get a lot of value out of um, learning from your experiences um, as a professional tennis player and also the insights from those experiences and how you apply them um, today in the work that you do. So thanks for joining us. Well, that was a great conversation. Um, I would say that one of the biggest takeaways that I had was the importance and the need to constantly be readjusting our goals. Um, Marius talked about how during this pandemic, uh, people have had to make a lot of adjustments. Um, people are not often where they thought that they'd be a year ago. Um, and we, as we set goals as um, athletes, um, as coaches, as uh, sports psychology professionals, as we set goals and we help um, individuals set goals, we constantly need to be um, willing to adjust them. We can't just set a goal and say, okay, this is my goal, period, um, until the end of time. We need to be willing to make adjustments, especially when something extreme like this pandemic hits. So I really like that point that, that he made. How about you, Brian? What, what was uh, one of your biggest uh, takeaways from that conversation? Well, just to pick up where you we're touching on Josh. I think um, even us sharing our own story about how we both had to adjust 
um, was it was a you know an example of that. And I'm sure all of our listeners have had some sort of similar story to what they have had to do over the last year or so. The thing I I liked, uh, I'm going to go to the clear links model, and, and and you know really since we've had this conversation, I've I've actually worked on this with several of the players I work with. Is the idea of after you practice or after a match, taking the time to visualize the positive images from the match, really locking that in. I think as tennis players, we're often very self-critical and, and we know what that is, but we don't want to that that we don't want that to be the lasting memory of a particular match or a practice. We want to really lock in that good stuff. And this is where when we talk about imagery, a really good post-match use of imagery. Again, sort of creating your own video highlight in your mind. So that when you think of this match later, you have built this library of positive images that you can go to. And I think that's what's going to help that virtuous cycle of, of self-belief. Um, so that's something I've really been emphasizing with players um, that I think can be very, very useful. So great conversation. I agree with you, Josh. It was, it was fantastic to talk to Marius. And um, So that's our show for today. Once again, many thanks to Marius Bernard for appearing on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. For more on today's show, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag TennisIQ. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, which includes YouTube, so that you can be notified of new episodes. Also, please check us out on Instagram, where we also post notifications of new episodes. Thanks again, and talk to you soon in our next episode.